There we go. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, lovely people, depending where you're watching from. Uh, this is Maria Lessi with the lovely Melanie. I'm going to get you to introduce you in a minute. Melanie and I were connected through a common friend, Steve Gregory, and uh, you know Steve through networking. I know Steve through uh, a program that we've both in, been in together a couple of years ago and uh, Steve's always been amazing uh, in terms of connecting me with people that are really beautiful valuable connections. Melanie you are one of them. Before we get started uh, and really dive deep into your story can you do us the favor and introduce yourself to our audience please? Yes hi everybody um, my name is Melanie Greenhouse and I Oh, I'm connected through grief, uh, through something I call the decade of disaster. But mm -hmm. my history or, or the career and the person I am is, uh, you know, I've always worked with people. So I was a youth worker by trade as a very young person, yeah. uh, went and studied youth work and then have just always worked in the community sector with people who have experienced um you know, some of life's really tough challenges and are incredibly vulnerable within the community. Uh, and I think the irony of that was that it was such a large part of my identity that when I got completely knocked over um, by my own grief journey, it uh, was an awakening that has just completely changed who I am. Mm. Uh, but, you know, my grief in particular was really about uh, losing my mum and then my sister and and then it sort of flowed from there and I'm sure we'll talk about that but at the moment I am um, a mum to four children two are my birth children and two are my sister's children yeah. and uh, I'm starting to empty the nest <laughs> and I think I probably just at 46 years of age uh, found out what I want to be when I grow up which is lovely <laughs> Can't wait to hear it. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm I'm a really big advocate of you know it gets greater later. Um, so oh, I love that. I've never heard you that. You know, and just um, yeah, just in a really lovely, lovely place at the moment. And um, you know, I'm working on my own business, and and you know, that's been a journey. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Just you know, married, uh, live in the country on 37 acres in a, a little place called Sutton in New South Wales. Yeah um and just yeah really enjoying life at the moment yeah that's incredible I'm so so grateful that you're here because we actually talked late last year and we were like all right let's start this year off with a bang I was so really deeply touched by your story so deeply touched for so many reasons um but this is not what the interview is about as in why I was touched I really want to share your story here because it is really truly beautiful so um Let's dive into that. You, you mentioned the decade of disaster. Is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, no. yeah, that's um, it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll let you take the stage, please, because it's your story. I know. Well, yeah. you know, it's it's really interesting. The decade of disaster, actually giving it that label has is really, it's in part, it's a coping strategy and it allows me to have created a narrative and to be able to really wholeheartedly share the story without getting... Um, I suppose, triggered into the past with that. So it's, it's actually a control mechanism for me. But it, in very short form, uh, you know, in 2009, uh, my mum passed away following, uh, a, she had breast cancer. So that was kind of like a five-year journey. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was her carer and very much uh, involved because she was a single woman at the time. And, um, you know, that, there was an intensity there. I had small, I, you know, just birthed my first child and then I had a second yeah. child. So it was, you know, it was already a pretty turbulent time in my life. Uh, so in the January of 2009, um, she passed away. Mm. And, you know, I was there for that and it was an absolute privilege. It was incredibly painful, uh, but I got to experience uh, you know, what I now understand was an anticipated loss, uh, mm -hmm. still painful, still difficult, but, you know, it had a different preparation to it. Uh, six months later, so my mum at the time was 54, so I was already, you know, I was just really sad about that because she was a younger woman and I was having to let go of the dreams, yeah, of, of how, you know, she was a really lovely nan and, 
uh, you know, what, what the children were going to miss out on. And they're all obviously very normal parts of that process. But then in the July, I got a phone call, uh, you know, uh, 5.55 a.m., as many of us will be able to remember the exact moment. And I picked up the phone and, uh, you know, it was just the call you dread. And uh, my sister had passed away. She had suffered a pulmonary embolism and had literally collapsed in her doorway as she was making her way towards the ambulance and uh, just died instantly. So she was 24 years old wow. and she had two children. She was in a really unhealthy relationship mm. um, and my instant response was to hang up and get to those boys mm. and I managed to take them home that morning and they've been with us ever since. So it was a, there was a 10 year process of uh, maintaining their protection mm. along the way because uh, they had the, the state got involved, mm. uh, which was just a mind blowing experience for mm. a family who were completely independent, yeah. you know, it, to, to suddenly have really another person. All of that happening at once, the great. Yeah, um, yeah for your sister and then having to deal with authority yeah. as well. Yeah. Is just incredible. And, and the delay in that grief was extraordinary. Yeah, I, I can't know. imagine. I really can't. Um, how old were the boys, your sister? Uh, so my, uh, my sister's eldest was five at the time and her youngest was uh, one. Wow. Yeah, so, and your you know. At that time? And yeah, so our children at the time were six and four. Mm -hmm. So I suddenly went from being a mum of two, which is what I wanted. And, mm -hmm. you know, lots of times, you know, when you're having a drink with your friends and they say, you should definitely have more kids. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm done. No, <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. tap is turned off. I was so <laughs> adamant. So to suddenly, uh, you know, be a mum to four under six, mm -hmm. uh, whoa. And it just changes your life. You, you know, oh. we, we couldn't even drive around in one car. We had to, <laughs> for the first bit, we were in two cars, yeah. uh, you know, one family going one place in two cars. So it was just mind-blowing, you know. Um, and then, you know, the rest of that particular decade was that we sort of settled a little bit. And then in 2016, uh, I got another call. Uh, I was at work. And our house uh, had caught fire and uh, burnt to the ground. And uh, the children were at home at that time. They were a bit older. And, you know, it was one of those sliding doors moments where they were saying, I don't want to get dressed. I don't want to go uh, mm -hmm. with you in the car because I would often take them and then swap them with mm -hmm. my husband. Mm -hmm. And on this particular morning, I rang my husband and said, how far away are you? He said, I'm 90 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's all it took. But they were amazing in their response. Nobody was hurt. Uh, but we lost, you know, everything. And when I say everything, it's not about the, it's, you know, it's not about the clothes or those sorts of things. But of course, I was holding all of my mum's possessions and all of our, I suppose, air, you know, heirlooms mm -hmm. and all of my sister's um stuff and and so and you know the 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 guilt that came from what have I done you know I've lost it all and how does that impact the children and their understanding of their mother and her legacy um you know was just it was so monumental mm. it really was and I think if I'm honest about the next part which I mean, you couldn't make it up if you tried. But then in the in the 2017, I just went to the doctor for a sore finger and I talked about how tired I felt. And she asked me, she said, you look tired. Yeah. And uh, I got sent off for some tests and it turned out I was um, in the throes of endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I was required within uh, four weeks of uh, being told that I had a radical hysterectomy in Sydney 
away from my support and, uh, you know, away from the children. And uh, it was just full on. And then there was, you know, the recovery from that and then dealing with being thrown into surgical menopause just for fun. <laughs> wow. Mm. So, you know, so hence why I wrap it all up and just go the decade of disaster yeah. and, you know, yeah. it just, um, because my Lord, yeah. how could you tell that story over and over again? It is incredible. I'm sitting here and literally just holding space for you because I have heard your story before, you know, so I, I kind of knew what was coming, but like sitting here with you and sharing again and going through it again, it really, it is just so incredible to even just comprehend that journey mm. and for me you know when you said like, like what touches me the most because I'm a mom too you know and I'm a, a mom of two boys like you were before you got your two extras um it was this whole you know your sister's kids were five and one and then there was this decade of keeping them safe and I'm like this decade when you just say it in in one go is like we're talking about their forming years, you know, the most important years of kids' lives are uh, really from year zero to seven where all these formations, all these, you know, subconscious uh, beliefs are picked up and all of that, you know, everybody who knows about that background, it's like, oh, my God, how on earth did you get through this to, uh, you know, create such a beautiful and loving home even though the house burned down because the house that the home is not only ever the the, the house you know okay. it's the the safety net and I'm having goosebumps all over my body just saying that right now you know the safety net that you have created um for all of your children and to form a family you know out of what you already had and then adding to extras and you know even even with the years in between you know the six and the four and then you get the five and the one and like you know all of a sudden you have like four kids under six and something that was so unexpected and the double whammy you know the anticipatory grief then uh, your mom's grief then your sister's grief the the feeling unsafe and then having a house burn down, I, yeah, I, I just had to wrap this up again because just to wrap our brains around it, watching this, it's just incredible. And yet you're sitting here beaming and luckily healthy these days. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Five years, five years clear. That yeah. So beautiful. And I've also watched your TEDx talk. So I'm so impressed by the journey that you have walked. And in all of that, being so present, being such a beautiful mom to your two and your sisters too, and really forming a new family of like, they are your own, own now. Yes. You look after them like your yes. own. Yes. And um, and that is just so beautiful to watch you with everything that you've done and with, with everything that you provide and give and that space that you give and hold for these boys, for these kids to then step on stage and tell your story and have time for that too, because I know what it takes to create and prepare for a TEDx talk and the application process you go through and, and all of that. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that. How was that for you standing on stage? I know you already said you were incredibly nervous, but this is just so normal for somebody who's not used to standing on stage every, every day and talk to thousands of people. But you know, how was it for you, apart from the nervousness, but sharing your story to absolute strangers on stage? What what was the uh, message that you wanted people to get away from that? Yeah, look, I think what really happened for me during that time, so I gave the talk in 2017, mm -hmm. actually not long after, I started prepping for it not long after the operation. Yeah. And it was really interesting because uh, I was drawn to it, you know, the, the, you know, that somebody sort of approached and said, we'd really like you to tell your story. And, you know, and I, and it actually caused me to go in and do some really deep thinking about what was the message you know what was the thing that I really struggled with the most and it was for me and I'd started talking about it uh, amongst friends you know in my community but it was very much about how on earth could we be all fundamentally moving through what is a very normal part of the human experience mm -hmm. 
and yet feel so alone in that yeah. how, how does that happen how could I be you know like just watching people sometimes cross the street because they just did not know what to say to me you know the number of friends we lost because they just drew away they they found it too difficult you know there was a time there where I really was I thought of myself as a bitter pill you know I was something that was really difficult to swallow and that was actually kind of the impetus for sharing the story because I thought it can be different it we can have a different relationship with loss Mm -hmm. Uh, and understanding now I, I understand the gift I was given which was that to experience the the different types of loss Mm. you know and it fundamentally brought me to a new understanding and depth of when I'm working with other people that often the symptoms that are that are coming out in through their life is somehow related to that a loss that they've experienced on a cellular level like when I'm working with people in Uh, you know say prisons is a classic example when I've worked with young people and women in prisons you know fundamentally they're not there because of a criminality that's Mm -hmm. just a symptom of you know the experiences they've had through life you know so the depth of understanding I got but so doing the TEDx talk was very much the beginning of my healing journey and interestingly I know you mentioned Marie that that the the intensity of the process to prepare yes but guess what that was also my time Mm -hmm. that was actually where I really understood self-care for me one of my core strategies of self-care is that learning the connection with others the um, you know just really engaging my mind in Mm -hmm. something that I believe in and that I'm connected to and, and it's positive so you know it was I was really I I in that moment like when I look back on it now I just can't tell you the amount of like when I when I went off the stage I absolutely lost my legs and I just (laughs) fell into the arms of my um a support person that was on the side Mm -hmm. and it, it was just this intense emotional flood Um, but what was really interesting was that the the talk was the talk and the message was about let's support each other through this let's understand that this is a really um, you know it's an important part of our growth and development as humans and community is how we support each other to get through it but it was actually the lunch break so I was just before the lunch break I think it was myself then there was one other speaker and then I had so I had enough time I did some interviews off stage and then I had enough time to garner myself and I went out to I actually was going to look for a glass of wine (laughs) yeah good on you (laughs) you know I was like mineral water no I think I need a wine but (laughs) I don't even know if I got it because I was just I was surrounded by people who just all of them were saying, oh, my God, Mm. I get it. I now understand why my mum responded the way she did when my father passed away. I thought that she, you know, wasn't willing, you know, to ask for help. Mm. And I didn't realise how difficult that was for her. And, you know, and and there was just all of this outpouring of connection you yeah. know and it was just that moment on stage was like a live wire was going out to everybody in that audience and it was electric yeah. so it became a really conscious moment of my healing that I if I ever get wobbly or I think ah, oh, you know this is really catching up with me as it does because I've got a lot of unprocessed (laughs) grief that I honestly I I had to make a decision Mm. I either get up for these kids and I you know get them going Mm. or I you know sort of collapse and and you know I I'm now in that position when the kids have shifted and they're all safe yeah 
that now I get to do some of my along the way, just gently, Incredible. just gently. Incredible. And I, I love, I want to highlight what you just said here. I love that you said I had to make a decision. I can either get up for those kids or, you know, and so often I would talk to moms that uh, say, well, I had no choice. And I'm like, uh, uh, uh. Always have a choice. You made a choice. You made a choice to get up for those kids. It's not you had no choice and you had to get up. No, no, no. You made a choice to get up for them. And I want to honor that in you because so often they don't see that. They don't honor that, the choice they made. They kind of push it down as I had to, but it's not. There are unfortunately people out there who don't make that choice, who don't find the power, the energy to get up for their kids who might find different avenues that really lead them into darkness or, uh, you know, depression, alcohol, what, whatever addictions, you know, or yep. sometimes unfortunately also suicide. So there is all this, I'm like, no, 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 there is the other side and you chose, don't ever give me, I had to, because mm. You didn't have to, you chose to. And I love that you said that, you know, I made the decision for these for these kids. And I love that. Love, love, love that. So now that you are going through your own, and I also like that you say gentle, gentle, very good. <laughs> Self-love, nurturing, gentle. Yeah. Your own journey. I, I often see that too, that in grief. Um, when you are going through your own healing journey, that it does re-trigger topics from your childhood that were left behind somehow and sort of pushed away. And then all of a sudden it comes up. I uh, saw that one that is very, very common is um, I hear often when people, when widows talk to me about, you know, I'm still angry for my husband leaving me. And I'm like, well, he didn't leave you. He died. It's a very different thing. The outcome is the same, but the intention is vastly different. And then you dig in and then, like as in digging deeper into their childhood and all of a sudden you see that there was an abandonment issue that was not looked at and then all of a sudden that's re-triggered so when I hear you say um you know I'm working through my own healing still and and we all do I think healing is like such an ongoing thing and it's such a privilege it's beautiful when when you embrace that and I feel that you do um you mentioned before that uh greater later I love that you found you finally found what you want to be doing can you share a little bit about this healing and finding who you want to be where you're going yeah look it's um and and uh, i you know just on the uh it's so interesting because for a long time i just want to highlight this for the i really i had this sentence in my head a thought that I had been abandoned by my sister and my mum. I felt left behind and I felt like I, my anger was probably that like, you know, they were off doing whatever they were doing, having fun together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was left here, you know, on, on the, on the earth, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, kind of mopping it all up. Yeah. So, and, and ultimately when I do do the work into that, you're absolutely right that it comes back to this sense of, you know, loss that I had around my father figure. Yeah. So absolutely to reiterate that to anybody that's that's listening or watching, um, you know, it's to sort of do the do the digging, yeah, do a little bit of the, the five whys, where's this coming from, you know, because it's really insightful and it's allowed me to go back and actually heal that kind of area of myself and really understand it realistically and my role in it as a child and then, you know, kind of do the work from there. But um, interestingly, going back to the, the question, uh which has now gone out of my mind <laughs> i just ask you know your healing journey and, and oh you yes the work to... yes yeah. yeah sorry so um coming from that like a community services background one of the things that i've always found a little bit frustrating is that you work with communities and with individuals and they tell you what they need yeah because as as i, I you know and i know we all innately know what we need. Yeah, we might be buffering it or denying it a little bit <laughs> along the way um, and guilty. Yep. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, having worked with those people, often what you know is that they don't have the resources or, or you know, I always used to call myself, I was a little bit like a, um, 
a night watch person, yeah? And if you could imagine I had a big uh, sort of hip full of keys and my role when I worked with people was to help them understand what they needed. Mm. And then I'd have a look on the keychain and say, I think I've got the keys to a couple of the gates, you know, the doors that you need to open to be able to access, you know, what you need. Uh, and that was all really well and good. And it's fundamentally my practice. But I always came up against this resistance with where you got the, the funding right, which was from government. And they would say, great idea, but what looks, yeah, but <laughs> what looks good for us is yeah. we want you to develop a program that fits this world, you know, this sort of worldview. And it was, you know, they were always rubbing against one another because they weren't really what people needed. Yeah. So, you know, having gone through sort of having that professional training and then moving through my own grief journey, I found this personal and professional nexus came together and it was actually my sister's eldest boy who was really struggling with, uh, he'd been exposed to a lot of violence mm. and he was definitely living with the impact of that, mm. you know, not only at a, you know, like at a cellular level, mm. but you could see the impact on his brain. Mm. And that led me into really diving into how could I support him and, and help him, you know, flourish. And it was that it really took me down neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, looking at the behavioural and really coming up with the evidence base. What could I do to literally help this young person? And well, he was a child at the time and then a young person hack his own brain. Yeah, to be able to do some of that recovery because, you know, he was living in a hypervigilant state, um, you know, he, the, the lack of trust, the bonding and attachment issues, um, you know, because he'd literally sort of been exposed to that violence in utero. Mm. And unfortunately, what I do say to people is that I'm really hopeful for the children and, and people that, we'll need to be actively recovering from that type of exposure. For him, the research is probably just, it lagged a little bit behind, you know, and so it was really tough for him. Mm -hmm. And he lives with that on a daily basis. But where that all sort of led me to uh, was, uh, you know, I've worked a lot with women in domestic and family violence mm -hmm. and those that are recovering from sexual assault and sexual harassment. And I just had an awakening about how I could work with women to really get to the core of their recovery, what they need and, and how they can, you know, do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I work with women on loss, mm -hmm. whatever that loss may be, you know, fundamentally, whether it's a, a relationship, uh, you know, a divorce, mm -hmm children that they thought they were going to have, children that they had that maybe developed um, or were born with a disability. You know, there's so many ruptures within our lives and it, the depth of the connection I can have with those people and the guide that I can be with them, it, it comes from the decade of disaster. It's absolutely yeah. what, um, you know, the universe or what I was encouraged to learn from it is really coming to fruition now in my work. And that is an absolute privilege to, you know, to be healthy enough and to be able to actually pick up, you know, those tools and, and do something really worthwhile with them. Yeah. I call them the hidden gifts in adversity. And you certainly have so many gifts. I, I really, oh, my heart is just overflowing thinking about, the impact that your work has on women you know and it's just so beautiful and I feel so privileged sharing space with you here right now and um, I want to make sure Mel that uh, we will be sharing links how people can get in touch with you or a website or whatever you have that people can contact you in the comments below after the interview so I'll invite you I know that you've joined the group meanwhile so I'm really happy that you are here if there are any questions around that if people want to get in touch with you uh, so they can just click on the link and find you and I'd also love to um, 
uh, for you to share your TEDx talk in the comments below yeah. so people can watch that. So I'll definitely get you to do that. And uh, I do want to have one quick side question because I feel there is one person in your life that really deserves um, a bit of attention here. And that is your husband. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about him because, you know, this is so... Uh. I think Look, women are such natural nurturers for them I think even though the journey was definitely not easy I don't want to downplay that but for a man to take on extra two kids and to be there and to be such a support person and such a rock in your life I want him to have a bit of a mention here yeah. and wave a little bit about him here do you know I'll tell you a story and this absolutely encapsulates Michael so um I obviously in going to get the boys that morning I went into lioness mode. So I was in very protective and, you know, my core purpose was to, to, to um, extract them. Literally, that's what it felt like. It felt like a mission. Yeah. And I did that safely and successfully. And Michael turned up and he helped me absolutely. And then uh, as we put the kids into the car, he looked at me and he said, you know, Ooh, what do we need? <laughs> and I was like, everything you know so and so you know off he went to the shops and he got a few things um you know and literally he just came home with everything he you know he was like is he still on bottles what is it what are we doing and I was just like oh my god mm -hmm. so it was quite intense but then a bit later on uh so so I must admit to for the first five days that um the baby was um with us he was on my chest and um, he really struggled because nice. he'd never been away from my sister. Mm. And so he lived on my chest and he had to be sedated a couple of times by um, our GP. So I was walking around and sleeping upright and showering with this little baby, going to the toilet, everything, ate everything with this child because as soon as he would come to, this awful wailing would begin and it was primal. It was like my friends, actually, you talk about the nurturing nature of women. A lot of my friends couldn't even come near the room when he started to uh, wail. Mm. So it was just such an intense uh, moment. And But I remember on that very morning, my husband was in and, uh, you know, does a very physical job. So he was having a shower and I was just sort of standing, bouncing this baby and he opened the door and he said to me, um, what does this mean? <laughs> and I had the most, I, am, I felt shame at the time, but now I, I, it is what it is, right? But I turned around and I sort of just almost bit his head off, but said to him, what this means is that we are now the parents of four children. And what I need you to know is, if you're in, stay, and if you're out, go, because I can't do this. I can't have one foot in each camp. So I'm in, and that's all you need to know. And he, <laughs> I know, right? It's a, I very rarely tell that story, actually, because I was just like, no, who just were <laughs> you? That was a horrible thing to do to the man you love. But... <laughs> But his response is him all over because he just looked at me and he said, got it. And he just shut that door and he just had a shower and he just stepped out and he has been their father ever since, just as I have been their mother ever since. And, um, you know, I laugh because we make an awesome team. Yeah. And I often <laughs> would, would sort of think, hmm. I wonder if today's the day that he's just going to get to our gate at the farm and just go, nah, I'm just going to keep going. But, you know, and so I would say to him often, thank you so much for driving back up the driveway. <laughs> um, so, look, he is just um, ah, just a loving man. He's, mm -hmm. he's a pretty typical Ocker Aussie kind of guy, but he's totally marshmallow underneath the exterior and... Um, he's just got a lot of love to give and he's a good man he's mm -hmm. one of the ones that you you would literally kind of say this is what we're looking for um so I feel very blessed I think you know I also like to say I chose very well yes you um did. you know it's not you mm -hmm. know, but no but look we humor 
uh, connection. So we always had an agreement that if we ever felt we weren't looking at one another and, you know, maybe our lives were putting our backs towards one another, that we needed to to come together. So, you know. Beautiful because I can only imagine how often that could potentially happen in a mm. situation like that where everything just yeah. goes crazy and there's so many levels of attention needed from both of you and sometimes probably even in different directions you know so to have that really clear connection it's just I love it got it (laughs) I love it so much he was in Not thank you enough for sharing your story today and I, I could sit with you for at least another hour here and I just want to really uh maybe nail it down to this one core message before we go what is the core message if it's just that one thing that you would like people to get away from your story from your life from everything that you have done you are so freaking amazing Mel I have no words seriously you know it's it's absolutely find the thing that helps you get up and if you need to lean on that lean on it you know, what is it that is your, if, if, you know, whether it's making a commitment to friends, yeah. even when you don't feel the need, you know, you're, you want to be under the doona. Yeah. yeah. You want to lose yourself in Netflix. You maybe, well, you want to lose yourself in a bottle of wine, yeah. whatever your, your, your grief is drawing you towards, you know, just know that you I used to make a lot of commitments. Mm. Yeah. And even if you not wanting to let someone down is the reason that you get up, Mm. if you do that before you know it, whatever that time may be, you find that way to get back up for yourself. Yeah. And so, you know, we can't do everything alone. We need each other. Mm. So if you have a friend, a child, whoever it is that you go, that's part of my motivation to hop up and to brush my teeth, do my hair, get dressed, Mm. drive to the coffee shop, you know, and because ultimately that connection is the thing that will continue to fuel and fill your reservoir until you're able to do it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I have literally nothing to add. I love, love, love what you have shared. I feel, again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I feel so privileged sharing space with you here. I'm so grateful that you came. Right back at you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, what a whooping start to 2023, (laughs) you know, to kick off our Up Spiral of Grief series um, again with somebody like you, Mel. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Thank you for having me. So authentically and so deeply. Uh, Say hi to Michael. And I will. They might want to watch this. I don't know. I think you will. (laughs) But I I just really want to say thank you for being here and everybody watching this. Thank you for watching. And we will be sharing Mel's links and also a YouTube link if you want to share it with somebody else who needs to see this. I'm sending you so much love. Thank you for being here. And this is Mel and Marie signing off. Bye for now. Bye.